All right. Good morning, guys. We are um, going to go over chapter five of The Last Arrow. This chapter couldn't have hit per more perfectly with it being the first of the month. Um, this is probably one of my most favorite chapters out of this book. Um, and I even caught a couple different things that I didn't catch the first time through it. Um, so I'm going to just um, point out a couple of the things that really stood out to me in this chapter. Mm. It's actually probably the longer chapter out of this book, which because um, they're usually really short. But um, I'm, I am going to play. A, it's barely 30 minutes of his sermon that he goes talks about. Um, about this chapter and what he had to say is just um amazing i mean he he hits other points than what the the book actually hits um he explains it so much better so i will play that but um i'm going to touch on the things that stood out to me that he he doesn't quite mention in the sermon so um and then i if anybody's got anything that stood out with them i would love to hear it so hold on so this chapter is um, refused to stay behind. Um, so powerful, so so powerful. It um, it made so much sense. Um, you'll you'll understand when you listen to him talk about it. But one of the things that that stood out to me in this this book was um, on page seventy, where it, it says people who are constantly praying about everything may be doing too much talking and not enough listening. The point of prayer is response. And once God has spoken, you don't need to pray about that anymore. Unless, of course, you were trying to change his mind. And I was like, I don't remember catching that the first time I read this book. Um, but it made sense to me. Um, there are things I don't need to pray about anymore. Like I prayed about them and I know the answer. What I don't need is clarity. What I do need is courage and conviction. Um, like you said, he's been married for 30 years. He don't need to pray for a wife. He don't um, need to pray about whether he should love her or um, be faithful or be a good husband. Um, he said, he said, then um, if you think about it, there are so many things you don't need to pray about um, and he put some examples which I thought was odd he said like should I kill him you don't need to pray about that you already know the answer on that should I steal that you don't need to pray about that either you already know the answer to that um then he uh, yeah it just makes so much sense sometimes we're just praying over things that we already know the answer to um instead of just like he said the courage and conviction of, of praying or other things or praying for more or I hope that's making sense to you guys and I think once you listen to him you'll you understand what I'm talking about but um, then the, on page 71 I highlighted this part where he said and I have talked about this um, in a prayer zoom before where he said for over the years many young men have come and asked me how they can have my life um, and I run into that too all the time people say I wish I had your life um, but what quickly becomes clear is that they want the life without the path. Um, they want the life without my wounds. They want my life without my scars. In fact, they don't actually want my life. They just want the rewards. Um, that is 100% fact because I get that all the time um, because I share my life on social media so much. I share um, all the things that I love. And but they and people want it, but when I tell them what it took to get here, they don't want that part. They want the things without the work. They they don't want the scars. Um, it, it, it's like the instant gratification um, that this world has gone to. Um, they want everything that you've got, but they don't want to put in the work. Um, then the other thing that I circled here was. Um, He said, I cannot say it enough. If you're going to live a life that never settles, if you're going to live the life that God created you to live, if you are going to be able to look back on your life 
and know you have lived it without cause for regret, then you have to refuse to stay behind. And he goes into great detail on that in the sermon. Um, so I'm not going to go over those pages. Um, but he did say, but God tells you to strike an arrow, you just keep striking and striking and striking. And you do not stop until you hear heaven shout, it is finished. Um, that really just stood out to me. I think I'm going to put that on my wall. Um, I thought that was really good. Then there was one last thing that I wanted to share. The rest of the stuff I'll talk about in the sermon. Put a big highlight on here it is. He said, perhaps the reason, so he talks about um, Elijah and Elisha, um, and he really explains the whole story with Elisha, um, not because um, Elijah kept telling him, stay here, stay here, and he kept saying, no, I, I go where you go, um, and he, he really explains that story more in depth, but he said, perhaps the reason so few of us have received a double portion of God's spirit is that the lives we have chosen require so little of God because they require so little of us. I'm going to repeat that. Perhaps the reason so few of us have received a double portion of God's spirit is that the lives we have chosen require so little of God because they require so little of us. Because we sit here and we take the easy way, we take the comfortable way, we take the mediocre way um, because it's easier. Uh, it's just easier. So that's probably why we're not getting the um, double portions of his blessing. Um, it, this chapter, this chapter, when I read it a year ago, really made me get off my butt. Um, and start taking charge of my life. This is what pushed me forward with this chapter because I wanted to um, I wanted to move forward. I wanted to be chosen by God and he's not going to choose me if I'm too busy and not saying yes to him all the time. So and everyone will talk about that in this sermon. Does anybody have I don't have the chat up. Does anybody have anything um, that stood out to them on this chapter? Or any thoughts or takes on this chapter before I start this sermon? No. All right. Let me get this stuff to share. The sermon is so good. It's going to be, it's perfect for um, starting this new month. And just like making that decision to just move forward. Okay. And let me know if for some reason you can't hear it. This past year, I, I spent uh, a good amount of my time writing uh, a new book called The Last Arrow. And, and a huge part of what I focused on are the differences between people who settle for less and those who never settle. The difference between those people who look back on life with regret and those who look back and know that they've lived their life well. The longer you live, the more you realize that living a full life is a rare thing. I am now just a few breaths away from 60 years old. And we're gonna applaud that, I guess. I don't know if it's an accomplishment. But one of the things I've seen over a lifetime is that the people I thought would really crush it actually got crushed. The people that you thought had so much potential and talent and intelligence and ability are the ones that were going to just pave a new path for humanity so oftentimes seem to be crushed under the rubble of their failure and their wounds and their disappointments. And still there are others that we didn't expect much from, like myself. No one ever saw any talent in me or any ability in me. No one ever projected I would do anything meaningful with my life. And, and so I've been interested to understand what is it about certain individuals that seem to start life with less but somehow seem to accomplish more. And those who seem to start with so much and accomplish so little. Now, I don't know if it's true across the world, but in L.A., we, we suffer from a condition called FOMO. It's the fear of missing out. I see this, especially with my kids. Well, I say kids. 
They're my adults. Aaron is 29, Mariah is 25. And, and I think generationally, there's this huge fear of missing out. It, 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 some of us grew up in a world with fewer options. I, I came from a country called El Salvador, and we would have maybe three hours of television. Not, not because my grandparents were strict. That's all the television we had. And, and because it was so dangerous, we couldn't go outside and play. We had very limited options. And so at the age of three and four, I was playing chess because that was our recreational experience. But now there are so many opportunities. I, mean, I didn't even know our neighbors. And now our kids know people all over the world. And there's, there are things happening all the time. And then when you live in a, in a major city, there are opportunities everywhere. And so they're constantly checking to see what their friends are doing. But what's going on? Are, are they in the most interesting place at this moment right now? And years ago, I, Kim and I had a friend who we would invite to eat dinner because he was single. And he'd say, well, can I let you know later? And I would always say, sure, that's fine. Because you know, some people like to hold their options open and, and they have a hard time making a commitment. And, and so he'd always say, well, can I let you know later? This went on for, for years. And finally, one day I looked at him and I said, David, well, when you say, can I let you know later, is it because you don't want to say yes in case a better option comes along? And he goes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so I realized all the time he actually came to our house to eat. It was because there was no other option. <laughs> but one of the things I also noticed is that he was single for a long, long time. And, and, and the part of the reason he was single for so long was FOMO. Fear of missing out. Because every time he met someone extraordinary, he kept thinking to himself, well, maybe there's someone better out there. It never occurred to him that there might be someone better for her <laughs> out there as well. But what I think is fascinating is that we have FOMO about so many things in life. But in the one area that we should actually have FOMO, fear of missing out, is in what God is doing in the world. There are things that God is doing in the world that are extraordinary. And we're actually invited into them. There are things happening right around us that are shifting the entire course of human history. And we could be a part of it and we might actually miss it. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be in the most mundane, boring, meaningless moment of your life. And just one degree in one direction might move you into the most extraordinary, life-changing, awe-inspiring, breathtaking experience you've ever had. So maybe what we need to do is begin to have some, some FOMO. When it comes to what God is inviting us into in the world. I have to admit, I have lived a life that I could only imagine. And sometimes I felt guilty for my life. I, I find it's much easier to not feel guilty to live a lesser life. But I, I've had the opportunity to travel across the entire world to be in cities and in places that, that I never thought I would ever walk. And I look back and I realize that I've walked the streets of Penh Penh, Cambodia, and Damascus, Syria, and Islamabad, Pakistan, and Cairo, Egypt. And I've gotten to go places where, where the window was so short I didn't realize that if I had waited even just a short time, I would have not been able to go back. So many times in life we think extraordinary opportunities will just wait for us for when we're ready. One of the things I've realized is that you cannot prepare, you cannot plan for extraordinary moments, but you can prepare for them. That so many of us want to live planned lives and act as if that's the way God moves. But I don't know if you notice this, but when you plan your life, God has a way of absolutely unraveling your plans. That you can't actually plan an extraordinary life. You can plan a boring life. You can plan a meaningless life. You can plan a mundane life. In fact, if you're not careful, you can plan yourself right out of life into existence. But if you want to live an extraordinary life, if you want to live the life that God created you to live, you need to, in a sense, stop planning and start preparing. But you need to actually have this FOMO that says, I refuse to be left behind. Because I look back on my life and I started asking my question, how is it possible that I have been in such amazing moments in my life? And I'm telling you, I have been in amazing moments. I'm just going to say that. Because I've come to realize that if your life is mundane and mine is miraculous, that's not on me. That's on you. So I don't have to pretend to live a mundane life just to make everyone feel better. 
See, I think a lot of us have been invited in, but we just never said yes. And then we can live in envy and even to feel a sense of, of antagonism and be adversarial to people who live the lives we long to live. A few years ago, I got to see a, a lifelong kind of dream take place in my life. It was a, a significant, world-shaking, earth-changing kind of thing. It's just something I wanted to do. I, I love football, soccer. And I, I wanted to go to the World Cup. I've always just dreamed, oh, I just wanted to go to one World Cup. And suddenly, I think it was a Monday or something like that, maybe a Tuesday, I got a text from someone, and they said, the World Cup finals are this weekend in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. We have a ticket. Do you want to go? It was someone I didn't even know. It wasn't someone that was my friend. They were not an acquaintance. I don't, I, 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 if I realized I met this person one time in passing. And he didn't even have the ticket. His brother had the ticket, who didn't know me at all. And they texted me across the country. They were on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. And, and I, I responded right back, yes. I had no idea how I was going to get there. I had no idea how it was all going to work out. I didn't even know what I was doing that weekend. I just knew that the answer was yes. I'm going to the finals or the World Cup. From L.A. to Rio de Janeiro, there's a way. There's a way. I'm an immigrant from El Salvador, the United States. I know there's a way. <laughs> I'm Latino. There's always a way. The Dutch must plan. We just go. So I, I, I emailed my assistant. I said, it looks like I'm going to the World Cup this weekend. I need, I need a, a flight. And, and I, I need a place to stay. And... Oh, I, I suppose I need a visa. <laughs> and I emailed back, yes. And, and I found out what happened was there was these guys in a room. And one of them could not go to the World Cup finals. And they had a ticket. And they sat in the room and said, who do we know anywhere who would drop everything and go across the world to see the finals of the World Cup? And in a room of strangers, they said, oh, Erwin McManus. See, I want to be known like that. I want to be the person that when someone thinks there's an opportunity of a lifetime who will change everything to go through that window, I want them to think of me because I want God thinking about me when he wants to do something extraordinary in the world. And by the way, if people aren't even thinking about you that way, I don't think God's thinking about you that way. See, I, I don't want God going, well, Irwin's in L.A., and, well, you know, he really can't be inconvenienced, and, well, he's got a lot going on in his life, so if there's something I'm doing that's across the street or down the road or that he can make slight adjustments, then I know I can depend on him. I want God to be able to look at me and go, it doesn't matter where he is, it doesn't matter where it is, I know he will get where he needs to go to do what I need to get done. See, I have a huge FOMO. I want to be wherever God is. Whether it's in Moscow or Cape Town, whether it's in Lima, Peru, or Louisiana. <sighs> yeah, even there. I want to be wherever God is doing something that's creating an entirely new future for humanity. How about you? See, the characteristics of those men and women who live the kind of lives that all of us want to live is that they refuse to be left behind. And you need to refuse to stay behind. And so my, my uh, office called me and said, well, we, we can get you a ticket. We can get you in. But we can't find a, a flight out. And I said, that's all I asked you to do. Get me there. Getting out, that's the next problem. Life is full of challenges. You get a challenge, you solve it, you get another challenge. If you don't want another challenge, then just don't step up to this challenge. Because the gift fighting a great battle is a greater battle. See, I think a lot of us think that, the, that the, the victory, the conquest, the gift of a great battle is peace. No, it's a greater battle. See, if you overcome a great struggle, the gift is a greater struggle. If you overcome a great obstacle, the gift is a greater obstacle because you keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and God can call you to more and to more and to more. Oh yeah, there's a passage of scripture I want to read to you. It's in 2 Kings chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1. 
When I started writing The Last Arrow, I didn't know that I would be diving into a study of the life of Elisha. But before I knew it, his life had just pulled me in. Because I want a life like Elisha. I want to know the God that Elisha knew. And I want God to know me the way that God knew Elisha. It says when the, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, that's how I want to go. In a whirlwind. Do you want to be buried or cremated? Whirlwind. That's why I'm going. Remember that, Aaron? And Elisha, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. Stay here, Elijah. Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it is not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and the horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. We all love the end of the story. It's epic. It will absolutely blow your mind that Elijah is taken out of this earth into eternity in a chariot of fire. That his last act was to transcend beyond this existence and go out in wind and fire. And then Elisha is left with Elijah's cloak, not knowing if he's received what he's asked for. He has the, the, the gumption, the, the incredible determination to go, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah's like, I can't give that to you. That's something only God can give to you. But it doesn't even deter Elisha. He just stepped right into it. He picks up his cloak, he hits the water, he says, where is the God of Elijah? What he's saying is, God, are you going to be the same God to me that you were to him? Because I followed him to follow you. And now that he's gone, all I got is you. See, I think a lot of us live our lives on a borrowed faith. And there must come a time where we stop getting carried by other people's faith, and we have our own faith. There has to come a time where we don't simply believe because someone else believes or someone else taught you to believe or someone else convinced you to believe. There has to come a time where you just know who God is because he is your God. And we all want to get to that place, but we don't want to travel that journey. See, I, I, I think this story has nuance and it's really significant. Significant to us. Because they began their journey together at Gilgal, and, and, and then Elijah goes to Bethel, and then Elijah goes to Jericho, 
And then Elijah goes to the Jordan, and each time along the way, they stop at the town, and there are a company of the prophets, and they know what God is doing. They each time go to Elisha and said, do you know that the Lord is taking your master today? He goes, I know. I know. You know what they're actually saying to him? Do you know this is the end of the road for you? See, because Elisha's life was only validated by Elijah's life. And in many ways, what they're saying to Elisha is all of your investment is coming to an end today. So why don't you cut bait? And Elijah was giving him that opportunity when he, when he was at Gilgal and then at Bethel and at Jericho. He says to him, look, why don't you stay here? And you can listen to the story. And there's a recurring theme here over and over again. Elijah says to Elisha, stay here. And Elisha says, I will not. And then it says, and so they went. See, I, I've wondered in my life how many times God has invited me to stay where I am if I'm not ready to take on more than I have. See, I wonder how many times God is looking for those people who actually, when they're invited to stay, say, I will not stay. And he, he wasn't staying in corruption. It wasn't as if he was choosing a destructive life. In each place, there was a company of the prophets, and they knew exactly what God was doing. They just chose to not go further on the journey. See, I'm convinced that there are men and women that God is pulling out throughout human history because they just refuse to stay behind. Because when everyone else said, you know, you've done enough. You're, you're intense enough. You're committed enough. You've sacrificed enough. You've risked enough. You've believed enough. It's easy enough to say, you know, I, I've done everything that everyone else has done. Do we really want the standard of mediocrity to be the standard of our faith? When you stay where you are, you stay who you are. And keep, we keep wanting to become someone else, but we refuse to allow God to take us somewhere else. And we need to realize that the journey is not about the miles, it's about the moments. Where God invites us into a moment, and we choose whether we step in or not. So, they, so my assistant told me, you can get to Rio de Janeiro, but we can't get you out. And I said, okay, it's all right, that's next week's problem, let's just get me there. Then she told me, well, we can't find a hotel. Every hotel in the city is booked. I said, that's okay. I know how to sleep on floors. And, and, and then... She Hold on a second. I have to say something on that. I, did you guys hear what he said? Um, he said, when, and I, I screenshotted this because I will definitely use this. When you stay where you are, you will stay who you are. That, when I, I listened to this sermon twice last night, um, as I was working um, around the house, and for some reason that just like stood out over everything. It was like I, I had to stop it and rewind it. When you stay where you are, you will stay who you are. So um, think about that. Think about that today. Sorry, I just had to. Um, Pause it there for a second. Okay, we need to find a way around this. So we emailed someone and I said, I need to get a visa. And it says it takes months. And so this person contacted someone in Germany. And someone in Germany worked for FIFA. And someone from FIFA who has never met me, doesn't know me, doesn't care about me, doesn't even remember my name, they hired me for a day to be a part of the marketing department for the World Cup. <laughs> so I went to the Brazilian embassy and I said, you know, I, I, I'm a part of uh, FIFA. <laughs> I need to get to the finals of the World Cup. I need you to facilitate my visa in 24 hours. And they said, well, do you have your documents? I had my letter there from the Department of Marketing. and. And I believe that was a Thursday, and my flight was on Friday, and she said, all right, on the way to the airport on Friday, stop by here, we'll give you your visa. So I go by the Brazilian embassy, I get my visa to go to the Rio de Janeiro, I have my one-way ticket to the city, I have no place to stay, and I thought, you know, this is a great story. So I'm going to Instagram it, and I'm going to put it on the internet, 
going to Rio for the World Cup finals have no place to stay. <laughs> Before I got on the plane, I had to reply, we're in Rio. We met in LA, went to Mosaic, found faith there, are in the city. We'd love for you to stay with our family. Sure, I'll do that. And then they said, the one thing we'd love for you to do is our family doesn't know God. Would you have breakfast with us and talk to them about Jesus? I kept wondering if God was sending me to Rio de Janeiro for the World Cup or simply to have a conversation with them. And the World Cup was the value added to the whole experience. Then the guy I didn't know got a hotel room in the city and he texted me after I'd been in the other house for a day or two. says, you know, you need to stay in the city for the finals because it's going to be crazy. So I shifted rooms. I've got two beds so you could come and stay with me. So I went and stayed in the city. And when I got there, I, I had some of the best seats in the world. I was there for the finals when Germany destroyed Argentina. And uh, it was a tragic moment. Messi is probably my favorite player in the world. And it was messy. <laughs> it did not go well. <laughs> and I had so many people ask me, how do you get to do things like that? It's really simple. It starts at the invitation. And you say yes. And you stop asking yourself why you can't do it. And you start telling yourself why you can't. See, the difference between people who make a difference in the world, it's not their intelligence or their talent. It's not even their opportunity or environment. It's that they refuse to be left behind. They just step into the moments and they just crash through every opportunity and they just believe that there is a future waiting for them on the other side of their fears. And I wonder what life you would be living if you stopped staying behind every time you were given the opportunity. If you just kept pressing in and leaning forward and believing that there's a future waiting for you. You know, one of the things I have really lamented is how much of my life I wasted living a life of obligation rather than a life of intention. I, I think so many of us live our lives under the weight of other people's expectation of us. And it's so much easier, isn't it, just to fit into the crowd? At, at every place, at Jericho, at Gilgal, at Bethel, it would have been so easy for Elisha just to stay with the school or the company or the prophets, just to stay there with them. And every time, Elijah, and I don't know why he said, you stay here. In my mind, I go, wait a minute, God, why would you do that? If you knew the end game, God, if you knew that they would cross the Jordan and Elijah would be translated into eternity and he would leave his mantle and Elisha would pick it up and that he would have a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, why would you have Elijah invite him to stay behind time after time after time? Is it possible that what God has to build in us requires for us to have the opportunity to settle for less, but refuse to accept it and say to God, no, that's someone else's invitation, not mine. Someone else can stay behind, but I'm going forward. Someone else can stay here, but I'm stepping up. Someone else can stay in this moment, but I'm creating a future. I just have a sense that all those other prophets, when Elisha stepped back across the Jordan, were wondering, why did God choose him? I have a feeling it's because God has chosen us all. He just waits for us to choose ourselves. You see, we, I, I, I was what, uh, growing up what they called a self-check in sports. That meant nobody had to cover me. I was so bad. I used to play basketball. And no one would cover me. They'd go, oh, he's a, he's a self-check. I never heard that phrase. I said, what's that? I said, you don't want the ball. You don't want to shoot. You don't want the weight of responsibility. And I realized I wasn't just a self-check in basketball. I was a self-check in life. I found a way to hide, to stay invisible, 
to, to use my past and my pain as my excuse for running from my future. And I made a decision. I'm just going to decide to shoot. I'm going to drive. I'm going to make a fool of myself, but I'm going to try to make that bucket. And I decided that that was going to be my metaphor for life. Yeah. I have become so comfortable with failure. Failure and me, we're good friends. We know each other really, really well. But you know what I've discovered? What we're actually afraid of are shadows. Fear isn't that terrifying when you've looked it in the face. Failure isn't that terrifying when you look at it in the face. You say, I know you. I own you. I have failed so many times. I know you better than you know me. And what I know about you is that you are a temporary condition. You cannot hold me back. I am convinced this is what God is looking for. He's not looking for the person with the most talent or the most ability or the most intelligence. He's not looking for the person who has the right background or the right education. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for some insanity. He's looking for a volunteer who says, I know I'm not the most talented, and I know I'm not the most gifted, and I know I'm not the one that everyone else would choose, but God, I volunteer. I volunteer for what no one else wants to do, what no one else has the courage to do, what no one else wants to sacrifice for. God, I am stepping up. I volunteer. And let me tell you what's going to happen to you. If you volunteer to step up and refuse to be left behind, you will not be celebrated or applauded by those who stayed in the comfort of their mediocrity and hid in the safety of status quo. They will look at you and say, who do you think you are? Thinking that God would do something like that in your life. Who do you think you are praying prayers that big? Who do you think you are having that big of faith? Who do you think you are? And you're gonna to have to get ready for it. You say, I don't know who I am. I just know that when you stayed at Gilgal, I kept going. And when you stayed at Jericho, I kept going. When you stayed at Bethel, I kept going. And when you stayed on one side of the Jordan, I walked across that Jordan. And I was exactly where God was. If you want to know who I am, you know what I love about is that Google Maps, you can drop a pin to a restaurant you love. Isn't that right? You can drop a pin to a park that's beautiful. You know what you should be? You should be the pin drop. You want to know where God is working? You want to know where God is moving? You want to know where God is writing a new chapter in human history? I'm the pin drop because I'm going to be wherever God is. And I want you to know that he is where I am. You refuse to stay behind. Refuse to stay behind. Don't let anyone else tell you that God didn't choose you. Don't let anyone else tell you that God cannot do great things through you. Don't listen to those voices. There's another voice calling you forward. Oh. You need to hear the voice of Jesus when he says, come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. I hear his voice so differently now. See, Jesus is calling us from the future. He's calling us from a place called hope. He's calling us in the midst of the uncertainty and the mystery. He's calling us to the great adventure, to the great quest. He's calling you on an epic tale because he sees the hero inside of you. And he will not call you to less. You want to know when God is speaking to you? You want to know how to recognize the voice of God? He is the voice always calls you to the more. Now I wonder if you're here, you've been wondering, is God speaking to me? Is Jesus real? Can I trust him with my life? But I know there's a voice inside of you saying, I love you. There's a voice you cannot silence that says you matter. There's a voice inside of your soul that says there must be more to life than what I have and what I know. And I want you to know your soul is in a conversation with God, it's time to catch up to what they're talking about. And right now, Jesus is saying to you and to me, follow me, follow me.
Wow. I tell you, I listened to that a couple of times, like I said last night, like I just kept playing it over and over. Um, but listening to it again today clearly just gave me goosebumps. And I just wanted to cry at the end because he's so right. He's so right. How many opportunities is God putting out there in front of you? And he's just waiting, like, are you ready to go forward? And I just, like, man, I, I like I, he was saying, I just want him to choose me. Like, when he thinks of somebody that will drop everything and do what he needs him to do, he, 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 I want to be that person that he chooses. But man, it was, did anybody else... Anybody got anything they want to add from that? Yes. Oh, my God. That was so amazing. Can you hear me well? Okay. Um, I get, like, I have Rob all the time. Like, who do you think you are? Like, who do you think you are? And I just show up, and I'm me. And I don't know. I'll call myself out. God winks at me all the time. Like, and I was listening to something, what is it, um, Outer Banks, we were just watching Outer Banks, and they were saying, you have to, what is it, you have to, if you, you have to believe in miracles for miracles to happen. Like, they're not just going to happen, like, if you live a grumpy life all the time, like, your life's going to be grumpy, but I feel like I'm a good pinpoint for, like, people, like, I, I talk about what I do, and I'm just trying to like share God's word. And I, I think if you look at me and you look at somebody else, you can see that the difference is God. Like I was talking to somebody, a, a new leader on my team last night, and she sent me this book and she wrote all these verses out from, it was, it's beautiful. And we were talking about uh, somebody new on her team who just is not into that. And I was saying how I always think that's like the miss, missing link. Like, and I think, I think it's John Maxwell who says it too. Like, I, I can tell you all the things to be a leader, but I'm going to add God into it. <laughs> like, because that's, he's, a, you know, like he's the missing link. And I love that this company has him and I just, I love yeah. it. I'm glad yeah. that we're the pinpoint of a huge thing. And this company is, is a pinpoint. What is, is. What? That's huge. What? It is when Mark started it, he he was the pinpoint and he started it based on his faith and what he wanted to do. And it just grew from there. And now we are a pinpoint to do the same for others. Um, and it's the same way with life. Um, we we can be that pinpoint or we we could just be the followers that, that stay behind where it's easy. Um, like all those prophets that, that chose to stay behind um, and not go forward. But Alicia didn't. He was like, uh -uh, I'm going, I'm going. Um, that it was just so powerful. There's so many, so many good points out of that chapter and and his sermon that just hit home. And like I said this the other day on a post, even I said, I don't post for the thousands of haters and doubters. I post for that one person, just that one that one person and when you get in that mindset of that's how you lead your life um you know people are going to say who do you think you are well that's because they don't know who they are it's not about you you know who you are i know who do i think i am i know i am his daughter and i am following what he needs me to do i'm not perfect by no means but I show up every day and I ask for guidance and I ask for um, just the words to help one person every day. And I use my business to do that because this business is what gave me my voice and the courage to put myself out there. Um, that's what I'm excited about. So just like he said, um, so, and that brings me to the point of like, uh, you think everything's, you know, good or whatever. Um, but you don't realize that that one opportunity, that one second opportunity could literally change the whole trajectory of your life. And I don't like to 
combine the business with our prayers in my life, you know, as much as I don't want it to turn into that. But my testimony to that is that that one opportunity that was presented to me that I thought nothing of in the very beginning um, turned and I almost missed that opportunity. I almost missed it, but I didn't. And I said, yes. And it turned in to not the business in and um, being a brand rep. It turned into me growing as a person and getting out there on social media and getting it louder about all the other things that I'm so passionate about, getting louder about what God's done for me and what God is doing. Um, that is what it's about. Those are the opportunities he's talking about. And, and then he talks about the, the FOMO, like everybody's afraid to do say yes to something because they're afraid something better might come along. How many things have you missed because of that, because you, I, I, I have a, a, um, a, a person that actually just joined the business and struggling and doesn't have a job right now. And they're trying to find a job. And she has this opportunity um, to bring in some income to help her until she finds a job that she wants. Um, but she's not seeing that she, because she's like, no, I know there's a job out there for me. And she's missing the opportunity to help herself get to that, that that space. It's little examples like that. And if you're not loud about things that you're doing in your life and that you're passionate about, and you're not loud about um, God. So when people see me being successful or they see my life that they want, they also see that God is the major part of it. They see that. And eventually they're going to realize that maybe the missing link for them is they don't have that connection with God yet. And, and maybe it will lead them to want that connection with God when they finally narrow it down and realize the only difference between me and them is that they haven't stepped into their faith. Um, that's what we're here for, for testimony and to show what he's doing. And um, there was another thing I was listening to I think it was Stephen Furtick last night that was uh, saying, you know, don't just preach these verses. You know, you don't have to memorize verses and stuff like that. And you just preaching these verses to people that that doesn't have as much effect as you showing what this Bible has done for you or is teaching you or is doing for you. But I hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, I think sometimes we just go and in the wrong direction or we're just so caught up or we just like oh that would be too hard and this, i'm comfortable right here and I, i'm doing good i'm a good person and i'm doing good and but you're missing the opportunity of what he wants for you and i even posted about that this morning i i think it, i said it as um uh, let me just look at it because i can't state it just perfectly right but at the very end i said and it's the freaking truth it said, show me the size of your dream and I'll show you the size of your God. And that is exactly what it, what it is. If you dream small or you live mediocre and you, you just settle, that's where you're leveling God at too. And he can't do anything with that. When, when, you, when you go for more and you get courageous and you um, jump on opportunities or take chances yeah you may fail but you won't miss those opportunities and he can't work with nothing you got to give him something to work with and you're just sitting there being still in stale waters that's how i always picture it like in a pond that has no moving water and it's got all that moss and stuff on it you know he can't do anything with that he can't do anything with that so I hope this makes sense to you guys. Um, so the, the questions, and I'll put this in the comments of um, when I post the recording in the Bible study page, um, the, the questions that are for this chapter that um, you guys need to think about. Um, he says, number one, who has the strongest voice in your life? Who has the strongest voice in your life? 
that's a good question. Um, and, and and some may it may not be it should be him and nobody else. All those people in your ear telling you you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, that you're going to fail, that um, whatever you're doing is wrong. Um, it doesn't matter. That that those voices don't matter. His voice doesn't. So who has the strongest voice in your life? Number two, when have you faced a fear and realized it wasn't as scary as you imagined? Well, I have several, one being this business I was scared to have, <laughs> um, and it turned out to be amazing. Um, when I married my husband, that was scary I because I was my fifth marriage, and I honestly didn't believe it would work either, um, but it turned out better than I imagined. Um, taking a chance on the farm it turned out better than I imagined. Think of all that. When have you faced a fear and realized it wasn't as scary as you imagined? You wouldn't have realized that had you not taken the chance think about that how do you and then number three how do you differentiate between a god opportunity and a self opportunity Hmm. that's a good one to think about what causes us to say no to opportunities think about that what is causing you to say no to opportunities Um, these are all like good journaling questions to be asking yourself and truly thinking about it like don't just write down your first answer. Think about it. Think about it. And then number five was when you have said yes to a crazy opportunity and what happened? Um, number six, what freedom do you think is on the other side of your fears? Um, those are all such good, good um, questions. So just get your mind going and, and kind of figure out where you are, where you are. Um, just mentally, mindset-wise, um, and where you are and who you are. So um, I'm going to pray us out, and I'll post this. Um, I'll post this um, recording on the Bible study page, and it's under guide. So if you guys um, go to the Bible study group page that I have in the upper right, in case somebody doesn't know this, in the or upper left corner, you'll see the three bars. Um, right or upper left corner of the cover page if you click on that it'll drop down and you'll see a section that says guides so all the recordings like from the armor of god and from this book are all in there under those guides so you can always go back and re-listen if you miss something or you can't get on these so i just wanted to reiterate that for some people because i don't think a lot of people knew that Um, so let's pray us out and let's take on another month and refuse to stay behind. Let's let's do something out of the ordinary. Let's not do March like February. Um, don't do the same routine, same routine, same routine, because then you're just going to get the same result. Um, so let's, let's just change. Let's just change. Dear God, thank you for bringing us here this morning, and thank you, thank you, thank you for the words that you placed in front of us and the thoughts that you gave our minds to think about and the um, the courage uh, that you're putting in us to want to move forward. Um, Lord, we ask that you just be with us today and give us that strength um, and confidence in ourselves to, to, to shut out all the other voices um, that are causing um, doubt in our souls. And we know that's not coming from you. We know that's coming from the devil, and that is not from you, Lord. We today are making a commitment. We refuse to stay behind. We want to be the ones who choose. We want to move forward with you, Lord, and we're asking um, just for guidance today. We just take it one day at a time, Lord. We're not perfect, and we're, we're so thankful that you forgive us for our sins and our mistakes that we make on a regular basis, but we're here, and we're showing up, and we're learning and we're growing. And we thank you for that. We thank you for always loving us, no matter what. Lord, just bless us today. Bless everything that we encounter today and give us the words to speak to others. Help us just change the life of this one person today. Help us to see others the way that you see them. Help us to love others the way that you love them. Search our hearts, Lord. Take our anxieties and our worries. Um, Take them. We're handing them over to you today. 
and we're just going to take on today with everything that we've got with the power of you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I could pray forever, actually. So much was going through my mind. Um, I love you guys. Thank you for showing up. Um, Rewatch that if you need to. And I'm excited to see, um, see some lives changing and some different patterns and paths um, from you guys. All right. Have a great week. Have a great beginning of a month. And uh, let's go. We'll see you next. Well, we'll see you tomorrow morning.